All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a, two of a special kind of session today. It's more of like a lightning talk. Um, just for this next particular bit, we want to see how this works out. Um, so we have two 30-minute sessions going back to back, and they're both about um, communication with our Hispanic communities and how we can enrich those conversations and make sure we're speaking in culturally competent ways and so that we're getting the message across. So I'd like to turn it over to Juvisa for our first, first presentation. Thank you so much, Diana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juvisa Rodriguez. Today, I will be presenting on um, health communication for non-English speaking audiences, or we can also say uh, limited English proficiency uh, audiences and, and communities, um, and talking about um, why we need to consider more than just translation of materials. Um, next slide. So uh, just a little bit of, of a brief agenda. I'll just give a little bit of a brief bio and introduction of myself. Um, I really want to dive deep into uh, really why we need to go beyond translation and really embrace transcreation. And I'll talk more about um, you know, what the term transcreation means for, for folks that may not be um, familiar with it. We'll dive a little bit more into this discussion about health literacy and health fluency, um, and also talk about what health fluency means for folks that might not be familiar with that. Um, approaches to reframing health communication approaches, um, and really sort of tie that together with this overarching um, you know, point about how we can really engage uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and frameworks and teams at our organizations to really connect with the work that we're doing as health communication um, experts and, and professionals. Um, and then lastly, just connect the dots and, and provide some concluding thoughts. Uh, next slide. So I like to think of my journey sort of like in this funnel, <laughs> if you will. Um, so my background is really rooted in health education, advocacy, and research. That is the crux of, of the work that I've done. Um, and it really has fueled this deep passion uh, for intersectional um, thinking and approaches, right? And so in this funnel, you'll see I identify as somebody who is bicultural. So my mother is from El Salvador and my dad is from the Dominican Republic. I am a first, first generation um, Latina American. And, um, you know, growing up, I, I grew, I'm from New York City and I grew up in Washington Heights. And so growing up, I saw that there were very few bilingual um, providers and health materials in my community. And that really kind of fueled, uh, you know, this career, this love um, for, for health, right, overall. But really, I began my career um, through the National Service Program AmeriCorps, uh, and then from then have really explored different avenues within public health. So that includes academic research at Columbia University Medical Center, um, to now currently um, being at March of Dimes, where I work on perinatal health education. So I am the senior director for consumer health um, at March of Dimes. Um, and, you know, throughout my career, and especially even now in this role, I've been at March of Dimes for about eight years now, I really have observed this chronic disinvestment in, you know, what I, it's, you know, culturally appropriate health information, linguistically appropriate health information, um, but also this, um, you know, lack of, you uh, I guess thoughtfulness or intentionality behind translation of materials and how, you know, a, a lot of times things feel too much like a one size fits all and, and it really isn't. Um, and so, you know, in addition to my professional experience, my lived experience has really shaped so much of my work. Um, and so in addition to, to being, um, uh, a senior director for consumer health at March of Dimes. I'm actually also a PhD student at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy um, here in New York. And so I'll, I'll be wrapping my, my second year up very soon. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I like to think of all my work as sort of being merged into one. Uh, next slide. So transcreation and translation, let's dive into that. 
Um, so trans creation is really a term that is very widely used and known in marketing, but that approach and framework has actually been shown to really have a lot of great value in the health education and the health communication space. So there's a couple of, you know, um, studies and, and, and papers and quite a few actually, but I pulled two specific examples here um, that talk a little bit about uh, how trans creation was applied uh, into that work. And so there's there's one um, RCT, a, a, a randomized control study, uh, that showed that audiovisual tools that prioritize trans creation really helped increase knowledge um, about clinical trials among Hispanic cancer patients. Um, and another study actually describes this misperception that was going um, on within um, Mex among Mexican women about folic acid. And so as it turns out, they were reporting that the use of the term acid in folic acid was, they thought was referring to an illegal substance similar to LSD. And so for anyone who might work in the maternal child health field, Folic acid is a very important um, uh, nutrient or, or vitamin because it's actually something that's been proven to show uh, a drastic reduction in the risk of having a baby with um, a, a congenital um, birth uh, condition, um, and so specifically neural, neural tube uh, uh, congenital uh, conditions. And so essentially what the researchers did was that they explored different um, approaches to trying to, that, you know, they tried to swap the term for a B vitamin, which is what folic acid is. And to try, they tried to define what folic acid is um, as, you know, plain language as possible to try and dismantle that misunderstanding in that group. Um, and so really, you know, when we talk about trans creation, it's, it's really going beyond the translation from one one language into another it's really about reconstructing that to really really meet the needs of the audience and the community that you're serving and you know as somebody that is a spanish speaker i often see this happening where you know we want to translate things from english into spanish but so much can get lost in translation um and really you know Spanish speakers were not a monolith right there's so many nuances um in within that right and so um I think this is a very key, uh, you know, key thing for us to consider uh, when we are working, you know, in in adapting materials from English into whatever other language, you know, we're we're working in. Um, next slide. Oh yeah. So I wanted to provide some examples of where they got it right. So um, um, this picture of the plastic straws is, was actually sent to me by a friend who had gone to go get food, you know, for lunch. And she, you know, we had been talking about trans creation and the importance of, you know, we can't just think that the same term is used by every single person, you know, that speaks Spanish, right? And so here, this was a really neat effort by the New York uh, City Department of Sanitation um, that, that talks about the restrictions on the distribution and use of, of um, plastic straws, um, splash sticks and stirs. And so if you'll see here, um, some people call a straw in Spanish pajillas. Other people call it bombilla. Other uh, people call it popote. Other people call it sorbeto, on and on. And as somebody that is Dominican and Salvadorian, I grew up listening to quite a, a range of, of uh, terminology, right? And so I thought that this was a really nice example of being aware, right, that we have so many terms that we can use for something, you know, for one thing, and how we can avoid really things getting lost in translation. And so on the the, the other image is of the um, forever free um uh, materials that were developed for a smoking cessation program. And this was actually you utilizing um, a really, so essentially the booklets, right, were, were created in English, but wanted to be adapted into Spanish. And so what this group of researchers did was that they really uh, paid attention to the fact that 
first of all, smoking patterns among Hispanic uh, groups looks a little bit different um, than it does among non-Hispanic, you know, folks. And so they took that into account. They did a literature review to really understand um, the differences and the nuances. They did qualitative interviews um, to really try and get uh, even more feedback from people um, about what are some of the common stressors, uh, you know, that, that, you know, are um, potential, you know, uh, triggers for relapsing and things like that. And so uh, I think that in this example, there was a really nice understanding um, essentially of that a literal translation would not work in this in the situation. And these materials are actually very um, impressively um, successful because it turns out that when you, when they use them in, um, among people who had, who had abstained from smoking for three months or less, after 12 months of a follow-up, the reduction in relapse was something like 35% versus just 12% when they used um, materials that hadn't gone through this process. And so um, I, I can share, you know, in the chat or um, actually in my slides, I, I do um, have like a list of references and I, I'm pretty sure that they're widely available to the participants. And I do have um, the, the paper in there. It's a really great paper and I really highly recommend for folks to take a look. So next slide. So where they struggled to get it, uh, where they struggled to not get it right, actually, that's a typo. So I wanted to use an example from March of Dimes. I love my organization, but we don't always get it right. So uh, Mother of a Movement is actually a, a signature fundraising event for March of Dimes. And I had been approached, I think now must have been a year and a half or two years ago, about translating this into Spanish. And so there was a lot of conversation about how this wasn't really translating um, well or properly, you know, for the Spanish speaking audience. Um, and then we got into discussions about how this tagline was really, when you think about, about it, developed from an English first lens, and it just really didn't translate into Spanish. And so what happened you know, really was that there was really a missed opportunity to engage with audiences whose primary language isn't English. And, you know, at our organization, we are a nonprofit. Events are really kind of an opportunity to disseminate health information and, and really be in touch with communities that might not actually be aware of, of the full catalog of, of, you know, information that you might offer or education offerings or, or programs and whatnot. Um, and so what ended up happening here was that that a mother of a movement actually didn't even end up getting translated into Spanish. It just stayed as an English, um, you know, as an English sort of tagline. Um, and so it, it, it's just an example, I think, of how, you know, before you go and, and you create something, you really need to sort of think about, well, what is going to be the implication of thinking of this from an English first, you know, lens, really, and how is that going to impact any other efforts that might come? Um, and so the on the other side of, of the screen here, um, I pulled the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. So this is a widely utilized to screen for postpartum depression. And I circled the word desgraciada um, because uh, that is essentially what the problem is in the scale. So uh, the scale, um, the Spanish version of the scale was actually developed in Barcelona, Spain, and then later on develop, uh, validated rather in Mexico. And for those of, of us that do speak Spanish, the word desgraciada can actually mean very different things. Um, and some of those meanings are actually uh, derogatory. Um, and so some of those, you know, meanings can mean unfortunate, unpleasant, despicable, unwise. And so as a mother myself, if I were to have been given something like this, it would have been, I think, very shocking to me to see that word there, um, you know, and, and very off-putting, I think, right? Because that's, that word is, I mean, it just it has a negative connotation. Um, and so when you look at definitions listed in the Bilingual Dictionary of Mexican Spanish, for example, um, there are even worse, you know, worse meanings for this word. Um, and, and they're pretty insulting. So this is all to say that, you know, um, these are examples of where trans creation wasn't necessarily thought of or, you know, prioritized and, and examples of, of how, you know, of, of, 
you know, how we can try to, you know, get it right and, and, and really not struggle, you know, towards the end. Um, next slide. So that kind of really, you know, I think um, sets the sets the tone for the next part of of the conversation. I think when you think of when I think of trans creation, I think of um, the ability or the you know the power that it has to really um, truly impact uh, you know health literacy and really truly get to um, trying to close that gap right um, in the health literacy issues that we know are widely. A, a wide problem um, in the U.S. And so um, some of you might have seen this data, actually, but, you know, the National Assessment of Adult Literacy, it states that only 12% of U.S. adults um, have proficient health literacy. And I think it's really interesting that the this assessment was conducted in, tw in 2003. I wasn't able to find anything that was really more recent than that. Um, there was something that else that was administered. It was the program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies, and that was was administered three times. Um, and but it's interesting because the way that it was measured, it was a little bit different than this initial one. Um, but it did find right like low le levels of literacy, low levels of numeracy, and low levels of digital problem solving among adults. Um, and so you know it. I think it speaks volumes, right, to um, essentially like what it's it's still a continuing problem. I mean, it's 2023. It's like 20 years later, we're, we're still dealing with these problems. And so, you know, to me, I think that making sure that um, the information obviously is written in plain language in English and, you know, follows all these these uh, frameworks and follows all these very critical aspects of, of what the core health literacy frameworks are is very important. But when we're doing it for an audience that whose, you know, language is not English, uh, native native English speakers, it's really critical because these are folks that are getting left behind. And as we know, are usually part of the group that, you know, experience um, health disparities at, at a much more, you know, higher rate, right? Um, so next slide. Um, and so, you know, that sort of like, going from health literacy so going from trans creation into health literacy right that's the connecting you know dot but then we need to also talk about health fluency as part of this because it's one thing to be able to write materials in a way that is uh you know plain language and like at a sixth grade or fifth grade reading level right but what people do with that information is also very critical right and so healthy people 2030 one of the goals is to improve health communication. Um, that's a very lofty goal, right? Um, but within that goal, there's an objective of increasing the proportion of adults whose healthcare provider checked their understanding of that information that was communicated, right? And so individuals we know that who are not able to understand health information, this is just sort of stuff that we know, right? They face challenges when it comes to making decisions about their health and health care. Um, you know, they they fall through the cracks, you know. Um, and so it's it's almost like this never-ending cycle of of um, you know, trends that that just don't keep getting better, right? Um, and so the US Department of Health and Human Services actually did propose redefining the term health literacy. But the thing is, is that that can actually have some negative implications. Um, specifically, you know, when you're thinking about the research that's already been done in health literacy, uh, you know, when you throw in a new term, it sort of, you know, throws off whatever information is already out there and things will just get lost and as as things do with academic research and things like that but um you know it does have some negative implications um next slide so you know there was um this great paper uh, by anchor at all uh, that actually suggested adapting the term health information fluency into the lexicon so rather than just like completely replacing something really finding a way to create a beautiful partnership, if you will, right? And so health information in, uh, fluency as defined in this paper is the effective use of health information by those who need it. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, and so in that paper, they also discuss um, how effective dissemination of health information really does 
require this focus on both those who communicate the information, but also those who seek the information. Um, and so we know in this country, we have an unfortunate problem of, you know, there's a lack of diversity in health providers and, you know, who speak a, a second language or a third language even, right? Um, and so we, we know that exists, but I think that, you know, by applying things like, you know, trans creation and, and, you know, really thinking of things from sort of, uh, you know, not just an English first lens, but, but thinking, casting a wider net, there's, there's ways to mitigate some of these effects. Right. And so I think approaches to health communication and health education, you know, we, we know they require multiple steps and considerations, but there are a lot of good, a lot of good comes from that, right? Um, taking shortcuts to just get something done never turns out, you know, well. It, it there's always going to be something that's going to end up sort of, you know, coming to bite bite us back, right? At the end. Um, next slide. And so, how does diversity, equity, and inclusion fit into any of this, right? And so, integrating, I think, integrating DEI in health education efforts is something that. Um, I have only recently sort of come across, but I thought it was really interesting that Healthy People 2030 has um, adopted two definitions for health literacy. So there's this personal health literacy and then organizational health literacy. And so organization health literacy has really sort of uh, been, been, is being looked at as a social, social determinant of health. And so um, you know, I'll let you read here um, this quote here that I pulled from from Healthy People 2030. But, you know, really, it's it's really sort of making sure that organizations are meeting right the needs of the populations, because, again, we're not monoliths, you know, as um, the Latinx population or Latine or Hispanic, however you identify. Right. But that's true for a lot of other populations um, and other ethnic, you know, groups. And so when we ensure that, you know, everyone, regardless of their ability, can have can be able to use the information and, you know, really apply it properly, then that's how we really get to advance um, health equity. And so you know, something happened in the last, you know, three, four years where organizations started to pull out these DEI, you know, DEI teams and di diversity and inclusion statements and all of that. But, you know, sometimes uh, their organizations are not walking, you know, talk, they, they're talking, but they're not walking the walk, right? And so I really argue that organizational health literacy should be part of DEI efforts and that organizations who are truly committed to being diverse, equitable, and inclusive will apply it to all facets because it's one thing to talk about health equity, but then it's, you know, DEI encompasses all of that. And so I, I don't, I, I think silos do not help anyone. <laughs> and so I think that by engaging in conversation with these teams, we can really push, you know, um, farther and really move the needle forward even more. Uh, next slide. So, you know, my final thoughts, um, you know, I think that, um, again, right, organizations that have committed to improving DEI, um, you know, they there's there's a missing piece there, right? And so health information offerings are not always created in this equitable or diverse or inclusive manner. And, you know, folks with limited English proficiency, they continue to have, have the same struggles, right, with accessing important information. Uh, health materials are being created without fully considering health fluency, cultural nuances, generational customs, right? And so some key takeaways are that ethnic groups, they're not monoliths. A shared language does not mean an equal understanding of information. Um, you know, we really need to embrace a multi-pronged approach. So shortcuts and disinvestment, it really does only create more work. Um, so does working in silos. Um, and we have this opportunity to really spark a paradigm shift so we can advocate for health fluency uh, to really be considered, right, as part of our health literacy standards in our organizations and within our teams. And so I really do encourage you to approach your DEI teams. Um, DEI statements, they really often focus on what the organization organization is doing uh, to ensure diverse workforce, but really when we think about it, the framework can certainly be expanded on, you know, um, full disclosure at my organization, I'm the only Spanish speaking person within my department who does the health communications work. 
um, and that that it's a lot of work, right? And so um, I think I've been very vocal um, and a fierce advocate for expanding that, and and not just for Spanish language. There's other audiences that we are just not even touching. You know, we do a lot of work, for example, in Florida, and there's a, a large Creole, you know, Haitian Creole population, a uh, Haitian Creole speaking population there, and so that's a you know um, another way. So I, I think that um, approaching DEI teams and and really um, having that conversation is very important and, you know, can, can make a very big difference. So, um, I think the next slide is just references that I have. And, you know, um, again, you can feel free to, to look at those and, um, hopefully they'll be useful. And I think my last slide is just final thoughts or rather questions and, and a thank you to you all for your attention. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jibiza. Did you want to take questions now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me see. Um, how would you make a case for the need for an organization to prioritize um, a financial investment in making culturally appropriate information available, particularly when often the budget for translation and interpretation services seem to be one of the nice to have budget items and maybe among the first to get cut? That's a great question. And, you know, I think if you work at a nonprofit, this is definitely a, um, a major challenge. I, I really think that it, it, it requires leveraging, um, you know, if your organization is very big on health equity and, and talking about health equity, really building the case that way. Um, and, you know, I know that at least at my organization, we definitely do a lot of work around trying to secure grants or sponsorships and things like that. And so if you have a corporate engagement team at your organization that does that work, I would I would really recommend, you know, maybe speaking to those folks um, so that when they do go out and get partnerships and, and whatnot, right, that they incorporate um, the, the, the need for these services, uh, you know, into, into that package and into that sort of pitch. Um, that's definitely something that's worked for us and, and it's been pretty successful actually. Awesome. I like, I like too how a lot of the points that you were making were particularly about, you know, Spanish, but I feel like so many of those points can be taken into like any language is that we look into because not a lot of, not a lot of languages are monolithic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next question I have is, what is the most effective way to ensure materials are created with a transcreation approach, especially when working with a very large population and not many staff who are native speakers of the language material are in? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great question. So I think that the, there are transcreation um, frameworks. This paper that I was talking about that with the Moffitt Center, they laid out um, their process. And I think, it, you know, I think it can be adapted, right? I don't think everything has to be as is. I, I really believe in molding things to fit to, to the needs that you have and also the capacity that you have. Um, and so there are frameworks that people do use uh, to um, you know, approach the, to do this transcreation approach. And it could look like, I mean, if you have the budget, right, doing qualitative interviews with, with audiences, maybe talk to your marketing um, team and see if maybe they've done some audience research and testing to see who the audience is or, you know, which pockets of the U.S., right, um, uh, you know, you're, you're serving most or, you know, th there's a lot of different ways of, I think the main thing is just communicating with the various teams within your organization, because more often than not, they're doing work that can like support your, your work too, you know, and vice versa. Okay, I think we might have time for one or two more. The next question I got here is, do you have or know of a list of organizations that can help with transcreation of materials in various languages? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I know that Communicate Health is a really great organization that does that work. Um, and so I, they're they're lovely. Um, I had a colleague that worked there for a bit, and um, you know, I've I've engaged with them a bit. So I I would recommend them because I I think they do a, a really nice job of of doing that. Communicate Health. Definitely, and uh, just to pitch IAT real quick, do we also help with the translation and transcreation as well? So if anybody has any um, need for that, we can also help. 
Uh, okay, one more, one more, one more. How do we integrate and include DEI and in health education on the organizational level, especially in educational organizations in states where DEI is becoming an illegal and punitive term? That is a really good question and very valid point. Um, you know, I don't know that I that I have a good answer, especially for states where DEI is becoming, you know, illegal and has, you know, all these just wild things. Um, you know, I I I'll say this much that when we at, at my organization um are confronted with sort of very big barriers and challenges that we cannot uh I guess, tackle right away or that it's larger than us. Um, the power of, of, of just creating these think groups within, you know, whatever department, I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And so I, I helped create like this health equity, um, not health equity, uh, inclusive language guidebook um, with the help of like five or six of my other colleagues that I had never worked with before, but I mean, the, the, the power of of working together is is amazing and and we were actually able to carry that through and get it integrated into our brand book uh you know which hadn't been done you know before because march of dimes does have an audience that can be more conservative and we struggle with the same things right about what term can you use without making constituents you know riling them up but then it's also like not just about those constituents and about very you know relevant issues that are happening in our country and 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 within these spaces so um yeah that's my recommendation and i can add a response cuz i do have access to the other questions in here so i'll add my response um in there Wonderful. Thank you, Jubisa, for such a great presentation. Thank you. Um, and hopefully we can work together in the future projects. Absolutely. Too as well. Yes.